Sahanavatu Sahanavunatu Sahaviryam Karavavai Tejasvinavadita Mastu Mavidvisha Vahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace. Peace, peace be unto thee, unto us, and to all thy beloved children everywhere. Well, welcome to our Saturday afternoon class on the book Divine Grace by Swami Ranganathananda. We are close to the end of the book, but we seem to move relatively slowly, so who knows whether we'll finish this week or next. In any event, when we do finish, we will uh, take up Swami Vivekananda's talk, Christ the Messenger. <clears throat> and that there will be a, another very instructive uh, venture into how and why we are who and what we are. So with that, any comments from anyone? Any questions or concerns? All right, Jeff, please tell us where we are uh, in the book and, uh, and begin to read. We are... Uh... Coming up on the end of section 21, which is divine grace and the philosophy of non-effort. And so we're on page 65, uh, the paragraph pretty much in the middle of the page. The late Bertrand Russell, the great agnostic and humanist thinker, suggests the need for modern man to surrender his inflated ego to something higher within himself. And this is a quote from the book, The Scientific Outlook. Man has been disciplined hitherto by his subjection to nature. Having emancipated himself from the subjection, he is showing something of the de defects of slave turned master. <clears throat> a new moral outlook is called for in which submission to the powers of nature is replaced by respect for what is best in man. It is where this respect is lacking that scientific technique is dangerous. So long as it is present, science having delivered man from bondage to nature can proceed to deliver him from bondage to the slavish part of himself. That concludes that quote. Shall we pause there? Well, it seems pretty self-explanatory. Um, <clears throat> science needs the guidance of spirituality and ethics in order <clears throat> to lead us in an appropriate and auspicious direction. That's clear. And we see very clearly what happens when it, that's not present. Um, I mean, History is rife with, recent history is rife with those examples. And uh, currently we're seeing it uh, develop even further in uh, what's the body politic and the body uh, spiritual right now. Anything else from anyone? As Dr. Martin Luther King said, science deals mainly with facts. Religion or spirituality deals mainly with values. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Bertrand Russell was saying. 
although Bertrand Russell was a, a an atheist, of course. Well, there was, I can't remember who, but somebody dedicated a book that they had written to Bertrand Russell after Russell had passed. And the dedication was to Bertrand Russell, wherever he isn't. <laughs> <laughs> What a what a clever dedication. <laughs> All right, then let's read on. Okay, so this is uh, the Swami speaking now. It is such a science, a science of human possibilities, to borrow a phrase coined by the late Sir Julian Huxley, that India developed in her Vedanta and Yoga. It is obvious that the current physical science and technology cannot be that science that can deliver man from the slavish part of himself, uh, quoting Bertrand Russell there, though it can and has delivered man from bondage to external nature. Physical science can denature plutonium, but it cannot denature evil in the heart of man, proclaims Einstein. Spontaneity through non-effort appears where the self is thus surrendered to something higher than itself, where the self has emancipated itself from the stagnation of its sensate tether. It finds expression not only in sainthood, but also in some aesthetic achievements and some discoveries of scientific truths in the physical sciences and generally in all creative insights beyond and above all intellectual and logical knowledge. I'd like you to read that again. Uh, that this is, again, one of these key points that the Swami is making. And he's using quotes and everybody's own uh, estimation also. So please read that again. It is such a science, a science of, human <clears throat> science of human possibilities, to borrow a phrase coined by the late Sir Julian Huxley, that India developed in her Vedanta and Yoga. It is obvious that the current physical science and technology cannot be that science that can deliver man from the slavish part of himself though it can and has delivered man from bondage to external nature. Physical science can denature plutonium, but it cannot denature evil in the heart of man, proclaims Einstein. Spontaneity through non-effort appears where the self is thus surrendered to something higher than itself, where the self has emancipated itself from the stagnation of its sensate tether. It finds expression not only in sainthood, but also in some aesthetic achievements and some discoveries of scientific truths in the physical sciences, and generally in all creative insights beyond and above all intellectual and logical knowledge. Beautiful. In all such achievements and experiences, the intellectual effort and struggle, though indispensable for the onset of the insight, feel baffled by the problem in front and retreats from the scene. When the truth quietly walks into the conscious mind, as it were, from the depths of consciousness, there is thus a spiritual kinship between Vedantic teachings about divine grace and all philosophies of create, creativity and non-effort. In the words of Professor Fritjof Kapra in his Tao of Physics, rational knowledge and rational activities certainly constitute the major part of scientific research, but are not all, but, but I, I'm going to start again. Rational knowledge and rational activities certainly constitute the major part of scientific research, but are not all there is to it. The rational part of research would, in fact, be useless if it were not complemented by the intuition 
that gives scientists new insights and makes them creative. These insights tend to come suddenly and characteristically not when sitting at a desk working out the equations, but when relaxing in the bath, during a walk in the woods, on the beach, etc. During these periods of relaxation after concentrated intellectual activity, the intuitive mind seems to take over and can produce the sudden clarifying insights which give so much joy and delight to scientific research. And that concludes the quote. Very well. It's beautiful. It reminds me of stories I've heard about Einstein Einstein getting some of his uh, best insights when he was out sailing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> well, he, he knew that the insights that are most fruitful come when the mind is neither here nor there. It's not attached or unattached. It's not thinking or not thinking. It's simply there. And so he had this habit of sitting in a rocking chair in his kitchen, holding in his left hand a large spoon. And below on the floor, was a big tin pie plate. And in those moments when he would let go of the spoon, but before it would hit the pie plate, this is when he said he had these fantasies, and that's the word that he used for them, not imagination, but fantasies of how things could be. So it's interesting that he was very aware of how the mind worked and was able to create an auspicious way to take advantage of its ability to generate these profound insights in the silence. He wasn't thinking about anything. He wasn't not thinking about anything. In other words, the mind was not busy doing or not doing. I think um, not just for spiritual, I mean, scientific insights for people like Einstein and such. Um, also for any sort, I mean, that's a creative pursuit. Anytime you're, you're synthesizing thought or you know these things are coming in the importance of idle time which um may seem unrelated but i think it's very related that uh so often children today these kids today and for some time you know parenting styles have been you know keep them busy schedule all their time uh and not having just idle time and then in, in fact it's boredom it's idle and then getting bored that causes the mind to start to create something to keep from being bored and it's also a problem with all of the technology and media and all this because you can just go to that instead of just having this idle time in, in, in the world and in, in nature to come up with these ideas. And I think it's, it's, pro, it's prohibiting a lot of real creative work because of that, the way people are living and kids are living. Anyway, that's my soapbox for the morning of the day. And, and so while, while their creativity uh, is diminished, uh, AI is coming in and starting to do creative works. And that's kind of a scary uh, thing when you consider both of those. Very scary because it's replacing your natural way of thinking and 
contemplating. So, <laughs> it's very, but a couple of other thoughts. I, uh, certain physicians and the clinicians have been recommending uh, a walk in the forest. So they're kind of saying disengage, just walk, take a walk in the forest in the nature and probably some wonders will happen. I also remember a, a certain section from Seven Spiritual Laws of uh, a spirit, a Spiritual Laws by Deepak Chopra, where he recommends that you need to disengage one day a week. Uh, you know, probably take a walk somewhere, hike. Uh, you know, disengage from everything technical, mechanical, etc. So that also seem seemingly is telling us that we need to disengage and probably let uh, things happen the way it needs to happen. And then a personal note, I, I find that when I'm trying to, uh, when I'm struggling to write an email or a, a section of a paragraph where I need some bullets uh, to clarify something without, you know, being diplomatic without, <laughs> you know, and being politically correct, I don't have those answers. But often I get up in the middle of night and I do have those bullets in my mind. So that's just a personal remark. Thank you. Well, I think Tesla was known for the same thing, you know, where you're 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 in that state, but the window shuts very quickly. And so, you know, he would hold the steel balls over a metal pan, you know, until his awareness slipped away enough that he would drop it and then that would snap him back awake in that very short window and he would write everything down you know but i think what the swami was saying about the kind of basically that the pure rationalism is kind of a dead end without the intuition and i think that's kind of what will limit ai that it just won't have that intuition it's just an algorithm So it won't have the intuition, but uh, we will uh, depend less and less on intuition and more and more on AI. And I think that's the danger we're, we're probably uh, getting into. Yeah, but new thought has to come from somewhere. And I don't, I don't think it actually generates new thought. It's just a better mousetrap. It just consolidates everybody's or the 80% mind or 70% of everybody's thoughts and minds. And it's, it's reactive. It, it does basically whatever you tell it to do. And that's not the same thing as uh, coming up with insights on your own. The thing is we've been, it's, it's too late because we've been using, I mean, AI is being, being used for lots of things and some of it's really great, you know, in medical settings and whatnot. Um, I think we're seeing it because it's it's cropping up in the media with this AI generated art, <laughs> which, oh Lord, I think people are, it's a novelty, that is a novelty, and people are like, oh, you know, AI this and AI that and filters for your phone and I think people are going to get they're going to use it because it's novel it's interesting and they're going to get sick of it that part of AI, but the other part there are you know just like every powerful tool, it can be used for good or ill and that's where that values and you know pure rationalism doesn't work because it's got no values it's got no. Um, compassion or insight or any of that so. You know, it, I think that there will be problems with AI, but I think ultimately people will get wise and bored and want it, want something else. Well said. You know, I heard one of the swamis say a term that about a person that was still very close to, you know, the animal person. And, you know, they said that, you know, he's fresh from the forest and, you know, meaning in their progression of, of lives through animals to human. 
you know, and I think humanity as a whole is a little too fresh from the forest for some of these things. And that's what that he was saying in that what we just read. I agree. Anything else from anyone? Okay, please read on. So this is the Swami, Swami speaking. In all intuition, the conscious self and the rational consciousness surrender themselves to something deeper than themselves. Only then does spontaneity manifest itself, bringing with it the other invaluable instrument of creativity, not only for the discovery of new scientific truths, but also for happy and rich interhuman relationships, namely imagination. In his lecture on Recollections of Lord Rutherford at the Royal Society in London on 17th of May, 1966, physicist P. L. Kapitza, eulogizing the intuition and imagination that enriched that great physicist, said, and this is reproduced in a, a book apparently called The Physicist's Conception of Nature. In the history of the development of physics, as in any other experimental science, the most interesting periods are those in which we are brought to revise our fundamental scientific conceptions. Then, not only deep thinking and intuition are required from the scientist, but also a daring imagination. Hello, dear. I think someone's just bringing me lunch. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, dear. So that was a stopping place, if we wanted to stop there. So would you read it again? Because I, I got interrupted by the... Mm -hmm. Um, lunch bringer. Uh, so I'll just reread the quote again. Yes. Um, and this is from physicist P. L. Kapitza. In the history of the development of physics, as in any other experimental science, the most interesting periods are those in which we are brought to revise our fundamental scientific conceptions. Then, not only deep thinking and intuition are required from the scientist, but also a daring imagination. And this is the Swami speaking. Then, after mentioning the names of Benjamin Franklin and Michael Faraday as belonging to this category, Kapitza continues. I mention these two well-known cases only to show that at a particular stage of the development of science, when new fundamental concepts have to be found, wide erudition and conventional training are not the most important characteristics of a scientist required to solve this kind of problem. It appears that, in this case, imagination, very concrete thinking, and most of all, daring are needed. Strict logical thinking, which is so necessary in mathematics, hinders the imagination of a scientist when new fundamental concepts must be found. The ability of a scientist to solve such scientific problems without showing a logical trend of thought is usually called intuition. Possibly there is a way of thinking which takes place in our subconscious but the laws by which it is governed are at present unknown. And that concludes the quotation and the section. Yes, our <clears throat> latent subconscious, which is uh, the, the, uh, the generator of so much of the energy that results in thought, and speech, and action is completely unknown to us. And it isn't until we practice meditation and introspection 
for many years that we come to understand the causes that produce the effects that we see both at the uh, uh, subconscious level and at the state of waking awareness. We begin to say, oh, that's the source of that. And then having gained that uh, awareness, we can begin to learn to control it. So it doesn't control us by so seemingly something autonomic or habitual. We can arrest it before it turns into action while it's still in the form of thought or, uh, or motivation or volition. I hope that made some sense. Anything else from anyone before we move on? And this discussion kind of reminds me of um, Star Trek, the original series, and the um, tension, I guess you could call it, between the very logical Mr. Spock and um, the very human Dr. McCoy. And that was uh, different ways of showing the strengths of logic and the limitations of logic and how the human element uh, plays an important role. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Which is uh, in the, when the next generation Star Trek came along, uh, a, uh, a prism was created to allow us to see how, how, uh, how our assumptions are um, are there, but so often unseen and unquestioned. And that was that character, Data. Data, all of his, he would come fresh to these things and uh, not understand them at all. Anyway. And can we compare intuition to Shruti? Like all the revelations that the, all these rishis got? Well, yes, of course. They, they, the Shruti means that which was heard. Yes. And so the, it would definitely be intuitional rather than rational. It wasn't a matter of intellectualization or ratiocination. It was a matter of being present to the truth until it finally has its pointed out by Patanjali, if you are present to the truth for a given period of time, concentration and samyama are defined by him, then it simply reveals itself. And that appears to be what happened with the Vedas. So well, that takes us back to the grace. Yes, oh yes. which is in the title of the book, of course. <laughs> yes. Anything else from anyone? Okay, please read on, dear. So we're starting um, section 22, the philosophy of non-effort versus creativity. Vedanta discerns a close spiritual kinship between philosophies of non-effort and the science of human creativity on the one side and divine grace on the other. They all point to some profound dimension within man himself, beyond the rigid cause and effect mechanism, and do not involve the invoking of any unscientific, extra-cosmic and supernatural source. But the way of thinking that produces a scientific intuition and the great products of creativity need not be located in the subconscious of modern Western psychology, as is done in the passage quoted above, says Vedanta, 
but in a superconscious dimension of the human mind. Vedanta recognizes a superconscious level of cognition besides the conscious, preconscious, subconscious, and the unconscious. This is also hinted in the recent studies of cognition with reference to human creativity by several Western psychologists. In his Studies of Creativity and Its Cultivation, which is the name of a book, uh, apparently, uh, Sylvan Arietti says in the American Handbook of Psychiatry, by the term creative process, the present author means a special process by which man tries to transcend in a desirable way the usual psychological formula of stimulus response. Although there is a fundamental difference between the infrahuman animal, which has a limited number of responses, and the symbol making human being, man too tends to respond in fixed ways. Whether his response occurs immediately after the stimulus or whether it follows a complicated set of symbols and choices, man tends to react in accordance with a repertoire or repertory rather of responses provided by his usual psychological faculties or by ways which have become common style of his culture. If his responses are mediated by cognitive processes, they generally follow what in Freudian psychoanalysis has been called the secondary process, and in more general parlance, Arist Aristotelian or ordinary logical thinking. Uh, the quote continues, the creative process allows man to liberate himself from the fetters of these secondary process responses. But creativity is not simply originality and freedom. It is much more than that. It also imposes restrictions. First of all, although it uses methods other than the secondary process, it must not be in disagreement with the secondary process. Otherwise, the result would be bizarre, not creative. Secondly, it must attain an additional aim, a desirable enlargement of human experience, either aesthetic pleasure, as in art, or usefulness, understanding, and predictability, as in science. Thirdly, the creative process tends to fulfill a longing or a search for a new object or for a state of experience or existence which is not easily found or easily attainable. And that concludes that quote. Well, what this all points to is not easily attainable means we'll only achieve it if we work for it. Working for it is practice. Working for it in the spiritual context is spiritual practice and the results that are yielded will be spiritual understanding. Not spiritual understanding in the intellectual sense, but spiritual understanding in the sense that we understand what the Atman understands and speaks to us in silence, speaks to us of in silence. Its wisdom and its knowledge are far greater than our any than are, are at all capable by the finite mind. It's not a condemnation of the finite mind. The finite mind has its purposes and its limits, but the Atman has neither purposes nor limits. So it can cut through these things, cut through all of the brambles that surround the truth, slip behind the brambles and come to a fresh or creative understanding of oneself, 
one's role in the universe and the universe's role with regard to us. Hope that rambling made some sense. So shall I read on? I would think so, yes. Side by side with this statement of 20th century psychology, let us hear what Swami Vivekananda said at the end of the last century in the course of expounding the Vedantic view of the various planes of human consciousness. So this is from the complete works because what isn't <laughs> when it's Vivekananda? Uh, this is a very lengthy quote, so I'll just uh, pause periodically in case uh, anyone wants to jump in. We see as human beings that all our knowledge, which is called rational, is referred to consciousness. At the same time, there is, very, there is a very great part of my existence of which I am not conscious. When the food is manufactured into blood, it is done unconsciously. When out of the blood all the different parts of my body are strengthened, it is done unconsciously. And yet it is I who am doing all this. How do I know that I do it and nobody else? Because it can be demonstrated that almost every action of which we are now unconscious can be brought up to the plane of consciousness. What does this show? That the functions which are beneath consciousness are also performed by us, only we are doing it unconsciously. We have then two planes. Okay. Powers section of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is about exactly this all the things that we are doing unconsciously that can be brought to consciousness. The question that arises is, what's the merit <clears throat> in terms of God realization? And the question, the answer is not much. So uh, it's probably not worth our time to uh, to make ourselves consciously aware of these things, though we can become consciously aware of why we eat and drink by making samyama on the hollow of the throat. And we can, we're told, yogis can, stop eating and drinking. They can make themselves invisible. They can fly. Uh, all of these things are there. Uh, because they understand the how and the why. And uh, as well as the what. But the, it's, as, as is pointed out to us by the Ramakrishna Order of Swamis, it's a pointless exercise and a detour. So don't bother with it. You want to read those last few sentences again, so that what I've said has some context? Um, I'll pick it up in the middle where he says, and yet it is I who am doing all this, referring to various bodily functions. Mm -hmm. How do I know that I do it and nobody else? Because it can be demonstrated that almost every action of which we are now unconscious <clears throat> can be brought up to the plane of consciousness. What does this show? That the functions which are beneath consciousness are also performed by us, only we are doing it unconsciously. Precisely. And, and we, it's because we don't care to put, put our attention. We relegated it to the autonomic or automatic or spontaneous. I don't have to think about 
digesting food when I uh, take this lunch that was left for me and I eat that food. I won't have to think, well, now I'll do this and now I'll do that and now I'll do the other thing. So what a blessing! What a blessing it is that we don't have to think about that stuff, you know. Exactly. Oh, I got to secrete some bile. Hold on a second, you know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> if if we had to be troubled with all that, the 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 uh, the most we really need to trouble ourselves about is be sure to chew your food well enough. You know, don't don't swallow your food without chewing it well enough. You just make things more difficult for the digestive system. So we are doing all of these things. The, the question that we learn to answer as we do our spiritual practices is, who is this we or I who is doing anything at all? And that is the most stunning discovery that we make is that this I is not at all has to do with the uh, it's not a it's not a, a, a creation of the senses of the intellect and of the mind it's a creation of the divine being which is represented within us as Okay, and if there's nothing else from anyone, let's read on. This is still Swami Vivekananda. We have then two planes in which the human mind works. First is the conscious plane, in which all work is always accompanied with the feeling of egoism. Next comes the unconscious plane, where all work is unaccompanied by the feeling of egoism. There is still a higher plane. Uh, um, let me uh, restart that. There is a still higher plane upon which the mind can work. It can go beyond consciousness. Just as unconscious work is beneath consciousness, so there is another work which is above consciousness and which is also not accompanied by the feeling of egoism. The field of reason or the unconscious workings of the mind is narrow and limited. There is a little circle within which human reason must move. It cannot go beyond. Every attempt to go beyond is impossible, yet it is beyond this circle of reason that there lies all that humanity holds most dear. All these questions, whether there is an immortal soul, whether there is a God, whether there is any supreme intelligence guiding this universe or not, are beyond the field of reason. Take that, Mr. Spock. Mm -hmm. Reason can never answer these questions. What does reason say? It says, I am an agnostic. I do not know either yea or nay. Yet these questions are so important to us Without a proper answer to them, human life would be purposeless. All our ethical theories, all our moral attitudes, all that is good and great in human nature have been molded upon answers that have come from beyond that circle. It is very important, therefore, that we should have answers to these questions. If life is only a short play, if the universe is only a fortuitous combination of atoms, then why should I do good to another? Why should there be mercy, justice, or fellow feeling? The best thing for this world would be to make hay while the sun shines, each man for himself. To get any reason out of the mass of incongruity we call human life, we have to transcend our reason. 
We must do it scientifically, slowly, by regular practice. And we must cast off all superstition. We must take up the study of the superconscious state just as any other science. On reason, we must have to lay our foundation. We must follow reason as far as it leads, and when reason fails, reason itself will show us the way to the highest plane. When you hear a man say, I am inspired, and then talk irrationally, reject it. Why? Because these three states, instinct, reason, and superconsciousness, or the unconscious, conscious, and superconscious states, belong to one and the same mind. These are not three minds in one man, but one state of it develops into the others. Instinct develops into reason, and reason into the transcendental consciousness. Therefore, not one of the states contradicts the others. Real inspiration never contradicts reason, but fulfills it. And that concludes the quotation. Well, anything to add? Anything from anyone to add to that? I was kind of, when he was talking about one state uh, leading into the next one, I was kind of picturing a, 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 a continuum, a spectrum where instinct leads to reason and reason uh, leads to inspiration. Well said. It's exactly what it is. We compartmentalize things, but they don't fit into compartments. They are a, a spectrum of experience. And it's only the, the experience is the only thing that counts. All the speculation, all the thinking, all the ratiocination. That's all preliminary making the effort to have the experience. So I'll read on. We have uh, as long as there's no other comments or questions from anyone. We've got about 12 minutes. Okay, well, let's just read on then. This is the Swami speaking. Modern psychology speaks of the knowledge derived from the pre-conscious states or the non-logical type of knowledge as primary cognition and that derived from the conscious state or the logical type of knowledge as secondary cognition. To quote Silvano Arietti again, according to the present author, it is from an appropriate matching of secondary process mechanisms with those of the primary process that the creative process emerges. The author proposes the use of the expression tertiary process for this special combination. So that concludes that uh, little quotation. Mm -hmm. So the Swami speaks, and after dealing with the different forms of the appropriate matching of the primary process within the secondary process to generate the creative process and its expressions in wit, humor, pun, parables, and poetry, the author proceeds to deal with its expression in science. So this is a longer quote of uh, Mr. Arietti. Mm -hmm. In a by now classic work on creativity, the great French mathematician Poincaré, don't know if I'm saying that right or not. Poincaré, yeah. Ah, I got one right. Yeah. Described accurately the moments of creative illumination that he experienced. In the morning, following a sleepless night spent working on a mathematical problem without finding the wanted results, he entered a bus. At the moment he put his foot on the step, the idea came to him, apparently without any conscious effort. 
that the transformation he had used to define the Fuchian functions were identical with those of non-Euclidean geometry. This sudden illumination was a breakthrough leading to a great expansion in the field of mathematics. Poincaré described his subjective experiences extremely well, but he did not stress the fact that his creative insight consisted of seeing an identity between the two previously disputed dissimilar transformations, the Fuchian and the non-Euclidean. In the previous night, and for 14 days prior to that night, Poincaré had accumulated facts, but accumulation of data is not creativity. Many people are able to accumulate facts. The creative leap occurs when observed facts are correlated, that is, when by perceiving a heretofore unsuspected identity, a conjunctive path or a new order is discovered. And that concludes that quotation. And so we, we continue to track all of these ways in which we form knowledge. These are, the, these are the ways in which we come to know things. But what is the point of knowing these things? The point of knowing these things is to allow, us, allow ourselves from freedom to attachment to knowing these things and, and surrender ourselves to that which knows, that which is the knower. But we can't jump right to self-surrender. We simply can't. We have to work at it for some time before we are satisfied that we can let something go and not have it continue to trouble us as a, as a concern or <clears throat> a, a uh, fear or doubt. So we, we come at this through years and years and years of work, which all of us who come this afternoon, we know this. That's why we're here. We're, we've been working at it. We are working at it. And to the extent that grace permits, we'll continue to work on it. Anything else from anyone? All right, dear, please read up. All right, we've got about seven minutes left, and we've got a very long quotation from uh, Mr. Arietti that concludes this section. Um, we'll, we'll probably just finish reading the, uh, we won't take time to discuss it. We'll just hear what he has to say and then come back to it next week. Okay, so I'll just blast on through it then. It is well known, uh, um, first of all, the Swami introduces it saying, Silvano Arietti then gives a few suggestions for the creation, for the cultivation of creativity. It is well known that creative people appear in particularly large numbers in certain periods of history in given geographical areas. This uneven distribution seems to indicate that special environmental circumstances and not exclusively biological factors determine the occurrence of creativity. Studies made independently by several authors have determined that highly intelligent persons are not necessarily highly creative. Although creative people are intelligent persons, an exceptionally high IQ is not a prerequisite for creativity. On the contrary, it may inhibit the inner resources of the individual because of too rigid, too rigid self-criticism or too quick learning of what the cultural environment has to offer. We must add that a great ability to deduce according to the laws of logic and mathematics 
makes for disciplined thinkers, but not necessarily for creative people. The science of promoting creativity is in its initial stages. The author can suggest only rudimentary and tentative notions deduced from his psychoanalytic psychotherapeutic treatment of a relatively large number of creative people. In the present chapter, we have seen how the use of primitive forms of cognition is a prerequisite for many forms of creativity. We certainly do not advocate a fostering of psychopathology for the enhancement of creativity. Some people have tried to do so pharmacologically by means of alcohol, opium derivatives, and more recently by lysergic acid diethylamide. These are methods that a psychiatrist cannot recommend. In addition to the danger of addiction, their value as promoters of creativity is more than doubtful. If it is true that they facilitate the reemergence of the primary process, they impair the use of the secondary process, and we have seen that creativity or tertiary process emerges only by a harmonious matching of the two processes. Instead of resorting to toxic procedures, we must consider and possibly recommend special attributes, habits, and environmental conditions. The first condition to be considered is aloneness. Aloneness may be viewed as a partial sensory deprivation. He has more possibility of listening to his inner self, to come in contact with his inner resources, and with some manifestations of the primary process. Unfortunately, aloneness is not advocated in our modern forms of ed educating adolescents. On the contrary, gregariousness and popularity are held in high esteem. Aloneness should not be confused with painful loneliness or with withdrawal or constant solitude. A second characteristic which seems to promote creativity is one which is contrary to the present spirit of American culture, and that is inactivity. By inactivity, of course, we do not mean schizophrenic withdrawal or catatonic immobility or excessive loafing, but the allowing of periods of time during which the person is permitted to do nothing as an overt behavioral level. I'm sorry, at an overt behavioral level. If a person must always focus his attention on external work, he decreases the possibility of expanding his inner resources. Here again, American upbringing promotes an opposite attitude. Excessive routine activities stifle mental activity and creativity. The third characteristic is daydreaming. It is in daydream life that the individual permits himself to diverge from the usual ways and to make little excursions into irrational worlds. Another requirement for the creative person is even more difficult to accept, gullibility. This word here is used to mean the willingness to accept, at least temporarily or until proved wrong, that there are certain underlying orderly arrangements in everything outside us and inside us. Creativity often implies the discovery of these underlying orderly arrangements more than the inventing of new things. Alertness and discipline are other requirements. Although they are necessary prerequisites for productivity in general, they acquire a particular aspect in creativity. Many would-be creative persons, especially in the artistic fields, would like to believe that only such qualities as imagination, inspiration, intuition, and talent are important. They are reluctant to submit themselves to the rigor of learning techniques, discipline, or logical thinking on the pretext that all these things would stultify their creativity. A humorous remark which has now become commonplace, but in which there is a great deal of metaphysical truth, is that creativity is 10% inspiration and 90%
perspiration. Mm -hmm. That concludes the quotation and the section. And how close are we to the end of the session? It is exactly one o'clock p.m. Eastern. <laughs> let us let us uh, conclude that that is auspicious, and uh, we'll take this up. We'll read that long quote again next week, and uh, take it up bit by bit and discuss it, because of course it is this the Swami is coming down to um, making his full case. And uh, so with that, we'll sign off for today. Tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, uh, uh, a talk on Kalpataru Day, that remarkable day in, in which Sri Ramakrishna conferred uh, spiritual illumination on some 30 odd of his close disciples, householder disciples. So until then, uh, 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, may you all be well and in bright spirits. Jai Sri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe, may we be healthy. May we be cheerful, may we have peace of mind. And may we know that that mother father being that is introduced to us in, in the uh, in the beginning of, that opens these sessions, that mother, father being. It is our understanding that that mother, father being, as mother, father, holds us in a loving and protective embrace. So be of good cheer. Uh, and uh, any final thought from anyone? All right, cheers. Until tomorrow. Or until the next time we see you. Uh, so good to have been with you. Uh, Happy New Year.